make a bold claim that artificial intelligence can fundamentally change our healthcare system for the better. And if any of you have experienced a prolonged interaction with the healthcare system, you know that tools are needed, that trying to understand all the data that's being created in the medical system can be confusing and frustrating. For me, one of these experiences happened during my second pregnancy. The staff called me the numbers girl because I was always asking for my lab reports. But this story starts with just one number, fundal height. You see, I was carrying small, and the question was, was this a healthy baby who just happened to be small? Or was this a baby in trouble? Actually, the first thing I did was to propose a third hypothesis. I said, maybe my great abs are just keeping the baby in. A quick survey on the internet of celebrity athletes and their large baby bumps rendered this hypothesis implausible. So we started looking at the numbers, the lab reports, as I mentioned, and ultrasounds. Maybe 50 per visit doesn't sound like a lot of numbers, right? But consider that every single one of those numbers has a reference range of what's normal and abnormal. And I fretted about whether those numbers were appropriately calibrated for petite Asian women. You all would do that too, right? Um, then came the Doppler waveforms to see how much blood the baby was getting. As an appropriately concerned parent, the first thing I did was to go home and read the entire radiology manual. I found many sources of measurement error that could mask the difference between safe and unsafe. So I don't leave you hanging. The baby is now a totally healthy two-year-old, so everything turned out fine. But I can't imagine how much less angst there could have been, how much less angst there will be once we have tools to better understand all of these numbers in their totality and draw conclusions. What are the patterns of babies with different types of problems, for example? And this was a relatively simple case, right? A relatively straightforward pregnancy. In the intensive care unit, patients are hooked up to multiple monitors each one measuring several times a minute. In the age of personalized medicine, a single omics measurement can contain 100,000 values. Meanwhile, the medical literature is growing at over 50,000 papers per year. This is simply too much for any human to be able to keep up with. Of course, medical overload, information overload in medicine is not a new problem. And since Roman times, we've had a solution called medical specialization. Your cardiologist understands your heart, your podiatrist understands your feet, your ENT knows all about ears, noses, and throats. And this allows clinicians to dive deep into a particular area. But it has some drawbacks. Because what if a disease is lies not in one of those individual specialties, but across multiple? How can we understand that? And to give you an example, a very simple one, I want to talk about dropsy, the thing that you think only happens to goldfish. But it used to happen to people, too. And here, the symptoms were very narrow, swelling. And the outcome, often death. It wasn't until the 1900s that we learned that if we broaden our view, we can do better. If it's swelling, and the person is expecting, probably due to the pregnancy, maybe not a big deal. If they're swelling and they have a history of cardiac illness, that could be heart failure and a very different sort of big deal. Fast forward to 2016, and the disease that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is autism spectrum disorder. Like dropsy, it can happen to fish. That's not what you were expecting. Like dropsy, it is a true fact. <laughs> like dropsy, it is diagnosed based on a very specific set of behavioral criteria. If a child has persistent social deficits and repetitive and restricted behaviors, that's the basis for giving them a diagnosis of autism. But what happens if we broaden our view? Well, we looked at the electronic health records of over 13,000 patients with autism, and we also looked at over 600,000 forum posts written by caretakers of children with autism. 
And using artificial intelligence to analyze all of these posts, we were able to find patterns that we never knew about because we were never able to look for them. We find that there's a category of children with autism who also have a variety of neurological things going on. They've got seizures and intellectual disability. Could their autism symptoms be related to those things? There's a different subgroup that seems to have elevated risk for psychiatric illness. And this group is seizure-free and relatively high-functioning. Could their ASD symptoms be coming from a completely different cause? And finally, a third group of children who, in addition to their ASD symptoms, have a variety of GI, allergies, asthma, all sorts of disorders going on. They look completely different from the first two groups. Could this be something completely different? All of this because we can broaden our view. Instead of looking in the traditional studies, which focus on one or a few clever but traditionally educated clinicians defining criteria that are measured on the patients who both qualify and have the capacity to sign up for a study or a trial, now we're looking at everything about everyone. By everything, I mean all of the things that every clever clinician thought to put down in the health record. And by everyone, I mean all the people who come in for, with autism spectrum disorder. So not just the people who can sign up for studies, but all the people who are also traditionally underrepresented in these studies. And similarly, by looking at the caregivers, we er see areas of concern that are typically not brought up by clinicians. By using AI to look at all of these, we're breaking down not only the boundaries between medical specialties, but also making sure that underrepresented groups are being studied and their symptoms are being understood. Looking at this big picture can help us find insights that we couldn't find before. Just to give you one example, we found a correlation between ASD and an increased rate of this GI disorder known as inflammatory bowel disease. And the reason why this one is interesting is because unlike other things that can go wrong with your tummy, inflammatory bowel disease is something that you can't get through some sort of repetitive or restricted behavior, like eating too many cheeses. So this suggests a legit brain-gut connection, which was once controversial, less so now, because we've had lots of data to be able to find these patterns. And once we can find these correlations, that makes us feel better about spending lots of money on expensive studies to follow up on the science to see what's actually going on. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about how we do this, right? I, I was called the numbers girl, after all. So computers only understand numbers. So the first thing we have to do is we have to take all the patient's records or everything that's written on all these forums, you know, everything very disorganized, and we have to organize it because computers only get numbers. We turn each patient into a long string of numbers called a vector. And what is in here? We count. How many times do they have a cold? That's one number. How many times do they have allergies? That's another number ear infections. Everything that we can possibly count, we count, and we put them into one long vector. Maybe also keeping track of when this happened, what age the child was when it went on. We do this for every single patient. So now we have these really long vectors for every single person. And then we use our tools from AI to start looking for patterns. The simplest version might be clustering. Can we find groups that look similar to each other? So that's something that AI can do. But there's still a problem. Because even if I tell you, here's a group of patients that look the same, there's still too many numbers, even about just one patient, for a human to be able to process. So here's where we need a second round of AIs that can convert this long, long string into a few concepts that we have names for. For example, this long cluster description well, it has mostly to do with allergies, asthma, some GI disorders, and some other things. And given these 10 or 20 concepts, the clinician can turn these into one or two hypotheses, such as inflammatory process or autoimmune process. This research process takes a team 
because the totality of the data is just too much for any human to be able to understand. And yet, AIs cannot make that final leap, not the least because we're, it, we're consuming the exhaust of the, these medical billing systems, everything is being posted on the internet. There's a lot of things in there that are relevant and irrelevant, and humans are very good at picking that out, less so for AIs. Together, humans and AIs are finding connections to help us better understand diseases. I want to end on a more personal note. My great uncle was part of India's independence movement, and I went to a high school that emphasized government and international studies. I was always a little bit sad, though, that my tendencies tended to be more academic rather than activist or service-oriented. When the tanks rolled into Kuwait in 1990 as a seven-year-old, my first reaction was to rush up and read the entire encyclopedia article on war. I just needed to figure it out, right? And then I could understand it and solve it. If you remember back to my experience with the radiology manual, I guess some things have not changed. It took me five academic degrees to really figure out how to deliver the warm, soft fuzzies with cold, hard computation. So if you take away one thing from this talk, take away the fact that AIs working with humans are poised to fundamentally change healthcare for the better by actually allowing us to use all of the medical data that we're already creating. It's already there by just allowing us to analyze and understand and draw insights from it. If you take away two things, these are big problems in healthcare and beyond. It's not just about adding AIs to the team. So whether one's tendencies are more towards computation or science, towards business or building, it's going to take a team to make all of these things work. So let's get cracking. Thank you.